Hey everybody, uh, thank you so much for joining today. Uh, today we have Morthan Dahl from the Zama team who's going to be presenting on fully homomorphic encryption inside of the EVM. So thank you so much for coming, Morton, and I'll uh, leave it to you. Yeah, hey everyone, thanks for inviting me. Uh, so let's jump straight into it. Okay, yeah, so what I want to talk about today is what we call the FH EVM or how to build fully homomorphic encryption into um, the EVM. Maybe as a, as a context, uh, the, our approach kind of applies to any type of blockchain or at least uh, to other VMs. Uh, but for now, we're focusing just on the on the EVM. Sama as a company is dedicated, or one of the primary focuses is around fully homomorphic encryption. So we have our core uh, fully homomorphic encryption library that's being developed by a large uh, research and engineering team. And then on top of that, we're building these blockchain components. So we're not launching our own blockchain. Uh, but we're rather providing the core tech components uh, for anyone that wants to build fully morphic encryption into, into their blockchain. Um, we are currently a team for the blockchain about 10, uh, and this is the result of what we've been kind of been working on um, for the past year and a half. Okay, um, so I don't want to go into too much details about this. Um, everything on the block blockchain today is, is public uh, for good and bad. Um, but some use cases uh, definitely require some kind of confidentiality or privacy. Um, one of the, some of the use cases that we're currently focusing on sorry, um, are around uh, keeping balances in a contract private, um, being able to do blind auctions where you don't have to reveal anything about the, besides the, fi uh, the, the final winner of the, of the auction. Uh, gaming could be one as well. Um, what we do is we take fully morphic encryption, which is basically a technology that allows you to encrypt certain values and then do computations directly on the ciphertext um, instead of uh, having to decrypt and then do the computation. So without going into too many details, we might take an encryption of X, an encryption of Y, and then we can perform a homomorphic addition on these two and get a third ciphertext, an encryption of X plus Y. Likewise, we can do comparisons between two encrypted values and then get a, a new ciphertext, which is then encrypting um, the comparison between these two plain text values, uh, but we can do this without being able to decrypt the data. More generally, we can take a function and then homomorphically apply it to various ciphertexts and then get an encryption of, of the function, or, yeah, of the function applied to, to those inputs. Okay, um, so what uh, fully homomorphic encryption does for the blockchain is that it allows you to take the inputs from users, and users can encrypt them, send them to the blockchain without being able to decrypt, the blockchain can process on this data, uh, including existing state, again, without being able to decrypt it. Uh, and we can also store the data on blockchain. So you don't need to keep a copy of the plain text data um, on the side for processing. You can really do all this stuff on chain. Uh, and we can do this, or we, we designed this in a way where we don't have to compromise on, I think, some of the important things. So we're not trying to do anything to hide the computation that's actually going on. So you can still see the logic of the smart contract, so you can still see what you're engaging with. Um, FHE also allows us to keep the, um, kind of the access control logic uh, free for smart contracts to implement whatever they need. So if you want to have um, certain access paradigms for your, for your data, you can do this. What in, concretely what we do, and we'll see this uh, when we look at the code in a bit, is that uh, you can basically program your own, your own access control, and if the smart contract says, okay, this needs this is okay to decrypt, then we we decrypt that. Um, FHE and the way we designed it also makes it possible to mix data from different users. So again, if you want to build a, um, for instance, the auction, uh, you want encrypted inputs from all the users, and then you want to compute on this combined data, uh, again, without being able to decrypt to figure out who won uh, won the auction. And likewise, you also a typical paradigm where you're mixing or you're, you're composing different smart contracts. So in your auction, you might have an ESC20 token that kind of supplies the underlying uh, assets that's being uh, that's being swapped. Okay, um, some of the more advanced use cases uh, is also um, having a trustless uh, bridge. So basically, you can take a signature key and you can encrypt it, put it on chain, and then you can have a smart contract generate the homomorphic. Uh, signature or signature uh, homomorphically using this encrypted signature key and then you can decrypt the signature and you can send it wherever you want. So you can basically move your, your wallet on chain because you can now keep data confidential. Uh, I already mentioned blind auction as a, as a potential use case um, and also uh, voting. So um, if you want to 
uh, hide how much or, or keep confidential the, the weight that you put in your certain vote, uh, you can also do that. Think constitutional DAO or, or some other use cases where it has been a problem that all the data was, was public. Um, so some of you are probably familiar with zero knowledge. Um, so just a quick word on how we see FHE comparing to zero knowledge. Uh, we see them as being really complementary. They both attempt to provide, or they both have a solution for providing confidentiality or, or privacy. Uh, we see zero knowledge more um, as a solution for scalability, for rollups, for instance. Where we think polymorphic encryption has an advantage is this composability, both between mixing data from different users, but also mixing a contract, having one contract call another contract. Um, one of the problems with zero knowledge is that the computation still has to happen, or the processing of the data still has to happen on plain text, and then you're just generating a proof that you did that computation correctly. So this means that if you're taking data from multiple users, then you need to find one entity that can that can see the plain text data, uh, and then do the computation on that and prove that it that it did it correctly. Um, and likewise, since you need this copy of the plain text data off chain, um, you don't get the full benefits of having all the data on chain as an FHE. Um, on the other hand, you can you can also mix the two. So FHE is not the silver bullet. Um, FHE together with the CK, for instance, could be a nice way of getting uh, confidential uh, confidentiality in a scalable way. Okay, so looking at the components that we provide, or the FH EVM, basically what we do is um, all the, the three dots here represent validators on the on the blockchain. All the data on the blockchain, including the inputs from the users, are then encrypted under a single global public FHG key. Um, so this is like a public key you, you typically know in, uh, in classical crypto, uh, in an asymmetric key pair, uh, except here it's a, it's a key that allows you to actually process on the data. So there is this public key is known to the world. Uh, users can encrypt the data under it. Processing happens in, happening under this key. But the question is, how do we then get to the key because, or the corresponding secret key? Because we could generate the key pair and then share it to the validators. Uh, but then we have the problem that um, someone has seen the, the secret decryption key and can then break confidentiality of the chain. So we have a bunch of threshold protocols that allows us to uh, ask the validators to collectively generate these keys and do operations as we see. And the first one is that the validators start out with nothing, and then between them, they can run a threshold protocol that will then generate shares of the secret key. So what we end up with is now we have secret shares of the secret key shared between the validators. On their own, these shares of the secret key doesn't leak anything, but they can come together and they can jointly decide, okay, now we want to use the key for certain operations. Uh, as we'll see. Uh, but there is a, a cryptographic assurance here that uh, seeing just parts of the key doesn't give you any any extra information about the actual key and doesn't allow you to do any computations, uh, decryptions, for instance, with this key. OK, and then inputs uh, are really simple, as I said. So the user here just has an X, and he downloads the global public FHE key, encrypts the inputs, sends it to the validators. When you want to do computations on this, the validators, they execute the smart contracts. The smart contracts, uh, uh, as we'll see in a bit, uh, can execute homorphic operations. So if the validators or the blockchain start out with an encryption of X, an encryption of Y, then the smart contract can say, okay, now I want to compute uh, an encryption of C uh, based on these two inputs using homorphic operations. Okay. Um, at some point, we also want to be able to decrypt values um, currently in two cases. One is in a smart contract, if you want to make certain assertions with a require statement, you want to uh, decrypt that require to see, okay, should we continue this transaction or not? Um, and of course, also, you, sometimes you want to, to get data out to the, um, to the users. So we also have a threshold protocol where the validators, again, they will not be, they will not see the full key, but they can run a protocol between them that will then take this encryption of X, decrypt it, and then say, okay, here's the plain text inside, inside the ciphertext. Uh, we also have what we call threshold re-encryption. So in this case, there is an additional key uh, here, blue. Uh, we'll see on the next slide where it's coming from. And then given this blue key, which is just a public key and the encryption of X, they will perform a re-encryption. Re um, so you now get an encryption of X under this new key. And they will do this without being able to, uh, without decrypting the result in between. Um, so the use case for this is when user wants to pull the data out of the blockchain, we also want to keep that confidential. We still want to keep that confidential for the, for the validators. So in this case, the user will upload or generate a key pair locally. He will upload the public key to the, to the validators. The validators will run re-encryption to get an encryption on the, of, uh, in this case of X, under the key they just received. 
and then send this encryption back to the to the user. Since he generated the key pair, he also knows the private uh, decryption key, so he can decrypt this blue ciphertext uh, and obtain the plain text value. Okay, so uh, where we are now is that um, or what we we have a DevNet that I'll be using here in a bit. Um, and what, what we're running there is we're just running a single validator node. So this is just a proof of concept uh, where it has a, a copy of the decryption key. Um, it's running our homomorphic library on CPUs. We're expecting speed ups from this and moving to other hardware uh, processing units. Um, and we have a lot of exciting stuff coming. Um, the larger data types, uh, still large proofs for, for the inputs. Um, we're actually rolling out the threshold protocols uh, later this year. Um, and yeah, also adding support for, for various hardware accelerators. Okay, um, but let's try to look at the at the code. Uh, keep this a bit hands on. So what I have here uh, is just I opened up typical remix, and one of the things we wanted to uh, to do was to not change anything on the developer side of things. So as a smart contract developer, um, of course there's a few things you need to adapt to, but you don't need to change your tool ch tool chain. So we're just using ordinary remix here. And we could start by writing our own an ESC20 contract, where we have, let's say, a public owner of it. Can you see this? Otherwise, please let me know if it's too small. Yeah, we'll see that the owner of the contract is whoever created it. And then we'll have our mapping here of balances. Okay, and of course we can we can compile this and we could um, actually let me just check that. But yeah, okay, the network is working. Um, okay, so nothing fancy so far. And then the first thing that the smart contract developer can do is they can import our. And let me just make sure I grab the right one here. Yeah, they can import our uh, Solidity library available uh, online for operating on on, uh, on encrypted data. When you do this, one of the things you get is you get a new data type, which we call an EUINT, so an encrypted UINT32. And by changing balances to be an EUINT, we're now saying that, okay, uh, you can still see that this address maps to uh, to something, but instead of map mapping to a, a plain text balance, is now mapping to an encrypted balance. So you're just seeing a, basically a ciphertext that, that you can't uh, decrypt. We can try to compile this. Yeah, it seems to run. OK. So um, in order to do something useful, maybe we want to add a minting function. So we say mint uint. And now uh, we want to take some amount from, from the user. So we say again, OK, we want an uint32. And then we want to require that the sender of this transaction is the owner. And if so, then we update the balance. The next thing we see here is that we can now do an homomorphic operation. So we're working on having um, operator overloading for this, so you don't have to have add, but you can just use a, a plus. And then let it. So what will happen here is uh, we will take the EU in that was associated previously with the owner, the new EU in we got in from the user, and then homomorphically add these two together to update the ciphertext uh, that was sold here. And this is done without, without decrypting. So this will compile, and this will be useful, but it's actually not exactly what we want. In order to understand that, um, I just want to dig into what this is EUN32, actually. And the EUN represents a ciphertext that has already been validated and is already on-chain. But what we're having here is we're having a function that's being called by a user where the user is providing the ciphertext. And the reason that there is a difference here is um, we want to prevent, or we have to prevent uh, users or malicious smart contract developers from essentially grabbing a ciphertext on chain uh, and then sending it into a smart contract and have the smart contract decrypted. Um, part of the reason for this is, again, we wanted to keep the access control logic flexible. Um, so as we'll see, it's really up to a smart contract to do this. So it'll be very easy to write a malicious smart contract that just accepts any any ciphertext coming in from the user and then ask for this to be decrypted. And that's obviously uh, breaking the whole confidentiality that we're trying to ensure. So when the ciphertext is coming in from the user, 
we actually need to kind of consider it as a raw ciphertext that hasn't been validated yet. And in order to do that, I'm going to change this to bytes called data. And say so this is the ciphertext. And then, uh, in order to do this actual check, I'll see you in 32. I'm going to ask the blockchain to oh, uh, to in to uh, to validate the ciphertext when it's coming. Okay. So what happens here is that we we uh, in the call to to convert it, the ciphertext actually comes with a zero knowledge proof of knowledge that the user knew what was inside the ciphertext. So in other words, uh, if he just grabs the ciphertext on chain, he won't be able to provide this proof, so he can't use it as a decryption oracle. Or intuitively, um, since he has proved that he already knows the plain text inside the ciphertext, if he were to write a smart contract that would decrypt that ciphertext, he's not learning anything new. So that's why this conversion is needed when it's data coming or it's a function being called from the user. The, the min function we started out with was useful if you want to compose uh, different smart contracts. If you want one contract that already has an EU in that has already been, been validated from the user uh, to calling uh, our main function, then it would just pass along an EU in 32. Um, another reason that we need this zero knowledge proof, uh, it's more like a technical detail, is that the underlying encryption scheme that provides uh, the FHE uh, operations and the ciphertext require that uh, basically the ciphertext is well formed. So it's not any, any random bit string. Uh, uh, it's a ciphertext. It has to be kind of matching a certain a certain form. Otherwise, there could be some leakage of the secret uh, key associated with the with the public FHE key. Okay. Um, so now we have our minting function. And we can try to compile it. And let's actually try to deploy it. Okay. And then. We have a, just for, for fun, we have a small, uh, we have an associated Java SDK for uh, interacting with an encrypted blockchain. So in this script, uh, we're taking an amount as input, defaulting to 1,000. We're then encrypting it on the client side and then sending a transaction, calling this main transaction. I'm trying to execute that, so contract, gem run, in. Okay, let's have a look at our So here we have the devnet that we just interacted with. And, oh, maybe not. Okay. Um, so here we see our transaction. And what I wanted to show is these are, this is the payload. Of the of the transaction, I don't have a way of decoding this for you, um, so I guess you'll have to take my word for it that this is really a ciphertext. Every ciphertext going into the blockchain is currently around eight uh, kilobytes, or every EUN32 is around eight kilobytes, um, and this is one of the things that we're also working on on, on decreasing. Okay, um, and yeah, so we now minted a coin or uh, a thousand tokens. The next thing we could try to do is try and get the balance. Uh, of this, and you may have noticed that when I defined the mapping up here, I didn't specify if this was in public or internal. Um, these EUNs, we now understand that they represent a ciphertext that has already been kind of ingested into the system and has been verified with the zero knowledge proof and so on. Very, very concretely, what they are, uh, they are just a hash of the underlying ciphertext. So when we ingest a ciphertext, like in the min function, we store the ciphertext on chain and then we give a hash of that ciphertext to the smart contract. So this means that these EUN32, they're very 
easy to pass around, very efficient to pass around. Um, and then we do some reference counting garbage collection so that you don't have to, if you're no longer using a ciphertext, then you, the, the memory can be garbage collected. But this also means that if you were to just read this DUN32 as it is, then not only would it be a ciphertext that's encrypted under a global uh, FHE key that you don't know the private decryption key for, it would be a hash of that ciphertext. So just reading the balance rule like this, or the EUN32 uh, like this, uh, is not useful. And what we actually need is we need to inject, inject some logic that allows us to now do this re-encryption I was showing before, where we take the EUN32, we take the associated ciphertext, and then we re-encrypt that ciphertext under a user-provided uh, key. So if we define a function here, balance of, that takes a user key, so public key, uh, I want this to be able to be called from, from users, just a view function, and then it returns uh, this new ciphertext. To do the re-encryption, we have another function call here, re-encrypt, if you re-encrypt, which takes the balances of message.sender and re-encrypts it under this public key. Uh, and for convenience, if this key was not uh, or this balance was not defined, then we return an encryption of zero. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Um, so this will work, uh, but there is an obvious problem here. So one is this is a view function so when this function is not being signed by the user when it's coming in so we don't actually know that message.sender is is who they're supposed to be in other words it would be fake or it would be easy to fake um, a view function call and, and impersonate as someone else or it would be easy to take uh, an existing call and then replace the public key with something that the that the adversary knows so what we need here is we need a link between the public key and message.sender and we're leaving this up to the smart contract, how they want to implement this. Uh, one recommendation we have is to use I, uh, EIP 712, which, uh, so when we generate, or when the user generates the signature for his public key, uh, he will do so with, uh, in our case, in, in, on this demo, with, with MetaMask. And then when MetaMask pops up to ask for a signature, we can actually sh show him some uh, intelligent message uh, instead of just saying, okay, sign these, these random bytes. So in order to that work, for that to work, um, I cheated a bit, so I'm just going to import the standard components. And then we'll add this modifier. Um, what this modifier does is it now takes the public key and the, the signature, and then it checks that it's that the signer, so first of all, that it was a valid signature on the public key. And then it extracts the signer and require that the signer is message.sender. So if I add this one up here, uh, let me just go up there. We say, okay, we now want a public key. Then we need to take the signature as input as well. Right. Coming in. Oh, uh, and then I need to do one thing. I need to say that this one is IP12. And when we instantiate this, okay. um, so again, we're leaving this open to the to the smart contract developer. Um, the only thing we need is is really the public key. But now we have we can check a signature on that public key. And let's see if we can compile this. Yeah, let's try to deploy it. So in the the little or the client side script I'm running here. Uh, what we do is we generate essentially a key pair on the client, so a public key and a private key. Then we ask 
the here just set up the wallet to there's a hard coded key uh, to generate a signature on the public key and then i'm calling balance up with the public key and the signature this is all part of our fhevm uh, javascript uh, library sdk okay but yeah our balance was zero here because it's now a new contract so if we want to see anything we need to mint again yeah Check with the block explorer. Okay, it seems to be successful. Yeah, all good. And then we can try to run balance up again. And we now have a thousand tokens. Okay, uh, so the last thing I wanted to show is okay, we can now mint coins and we can get the balance up, but we also need to be able to, or be nice to, to be able to transfer things. So let's make a transfer function, add those two. And again, this is a, if this was an internal function or, or to be called by another smart contract, we would pass in an EUN32 amount here, for instance. But since this is a user call function where we want to have a ciphertext coming in from the user, we need to do this verification step. So again, from say, okay, these are just the, the amount of ciphertext. And then uh, we want to convert this do the zero knowledge checks. This. So now we got our amount. Then we can also homomorphically compute if we have enough. So if the amount is less than the current balance of the sender. Again, we will compute this homomorphically without decrypting any of the data. And then we will arrive with an encrypted Boolean. Um, and then we basically want to require that this is true. So what happens here is when we ask, here we ask the validators to perform a decryption of this Boolean value. And then we require that this decrypted Boolean value was, was true. T -T -T -T. And if that's okay, then we can say, okay. Balances, we can add the amount to the recipient and subtract it from the Let me just close the window here, one sec. Our Paris is in the middle of Paris, just our office in the middle of Paris, just in case. Uh, any doubt about that? Okay. Um, so yeah. So the thing to highlight here is, of course, that we can do these required statements. Um, there is a small leakage involved with this, um, and I'll get back to that in a in a second. But yeah, now we have a transfer function as well. So I will compile the contract just to see if it works. Trying to deploy it. Um, right now, since it's a new contract, uh, I don't have any balance on it. We should have a thousand. Then I have a different account here. I can try to transfer to. So now we're uh, calling this uh, new transfer function. We're sending 100 tokens. So if I take the balance off of the old account, I see you have 900 left. Um, we have a quick demo website here as well, where I can type in the contract. Oh. Just to show this on the on the user side. So we now have the contract. Let me make sure I'm switched to the one we just, the account we just send tokens to. And then when I get balance now, so this is the step where we're locally generating uh, a key pair and then doing a signature. We'll see that MetaMask pops up. We can say, okay, we're asking for a re-encrypt using this new gen generated public key. I'm okay with that. And then we get back 
uh, 100 uh, for the for the balance okay um then let me jump back into this um the first thing we saw was this eu 32 that represents an encrypted value uh, that can be used for computation, storage, composition, and so on. And as I said, it's very efficient uh, to pass around because it's just handles or hashes of ciphertext. We have EUNT 8, 16, 32. We're adding uh, 64, 128. We can do various operations, add more multiplication uh, comparisons on this. Um, the second thing we saw was that you have to, con when, when, you're, when it's a user call function, you have to convert it into an EUNT. Um, and what happens during that conversion is basically we check these two things. The first, that the ciphertext is well formed from a cryptographic perspective. That is not uh, that there's uh, no associated risk um, by interpreting this these bytes as uh, a ciphertext. And then also this idea that the user needs to prove that he knew the underlying plain text, because otherwise he could he could use this as a kind of a decryption oracle, the blockchain. Uh, we had the re-encrypt. Um, I don't think I need to cover that anymore. And then the requirement, uh, where we basically decrypt the Boolean value and then do a require on that. As I said, this leaks something. It's not always clear what it leaks, but at least leaks one bit of information. And then what can be deduced from that one bit of information, basically whether or not the transaction uh, was reverted. Maybe that's too much in some cases. So as an alternative to a require, we also have what's called the CMUX. So in the CMUX, you compute uh, the encrypted value that you want to, to propagate forward uh, if, your, if your Boolean is true and the value that you want to propagate forward if your uh, encrypted Boolean is false. And then you do basically a condition on this. So this generates a fresh ciphertext. So you won't be able to compare the result of the CMUX with uh, E true value, or E false value in this case. It will be a fresh ciphertext and it will contain or it will be the plain text inside will be uh, the same as e, e true value or E false value, depending on uh, E condition. Okay, and that's it on my side. And then, yeah, we'd love to hear or answer any questions you might have on, on this. Great. Oh, so it, was a, thing. Oh, go ahead. it was a great, a great presentation. I have a mountain of questions. So I, if anyone wants to go before me, uh, I feel like I might take a while, but, uh, yeah, if, if there's no one else that has any questions, I can start rallying them off. I was taking notes. Uh, maybe Martin, you could go first. Yeah, I just heard like in the uh, like uh, short that you said the U and uh, doesn't have 32 bytes anymore, but was like uh, the size increases to I think a couple of kilobytes. So I was wondering like how much is kind of this overhead we have to, yeah, we have to uh, like allocate uh, storage there for the encrypted UNs compared to the to the relatively small regular UNs. So an, an encrypted EUN on its own, since it's just a hash, it's 256 bits, so it's very small. Uh, but the underlying ciphertext that is uh, that is pointing to uh, is significantly larger. So when it's an input coming from the user, currently it's around eight kilobytes uh, for a 32-bit value, but actually for all of them, uh, all the way up to an EUN 256 uh, that we also experimented with. Uh, but when the data, so there's a, there's a blow up there for the, for the inputs. Um, and then also when you compute on the ciphertext, you have to kind of convert them from, from the input format into a format that you can compute on them. And currently the size there is around 100 kilobytes. Um, so we're working on uh, basically squeezing all this stuff down. Uh, that's one of the key, res key research uh, focuses we have, like getting the sizes uh, smaller. Is is the eight kilobytes primarily the zero knowledge proof, or is it the actual encrypted value? Um, so that's the actual encrypted value. Yeah. So the dev, yeah, sorry, the devnet we just saw. Uh, I think I had a quick slide on it. Uh, only encrypts the uh, only contains the actual ciphertext, and then we're adding the zero knowledge proof. But the zero knowledge proof itself um, is is not massive. Um, it's significantly smaller than the ciphertext. Uh, one question I was going to ask Morton, and let me know if this is too much to go into now, but could you talk a bit about what your uh, uh, key generation protocol is for the global homomorphic key? So for that one, we're actually just using a generic protocol. Um, we'll assume, okay, this is only happening uh, once, so we don't have to pay any special attention to it. 
Uh, what we've been trying to optimize is really the decryption routine and the re-encryption routine, uh, because those are being executed much more often. And does one that... The... Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Uh, no, I just want to add that. So one of the benefits we have is that Sama as a company is only focusing on one encryption scheme, TFHE. So it means that the MPC or the threshold protocols that we generate, we can optimize those for that particular encryption scheme. Cool. Um, I was going to ask, does that mean that once you do the key generation protocol, you're, you're locked into the validator set from that point forward and it's not a dynamic validator set? Uh, no. So we have resharing protocols. So when you go okay. from one, one set of validators to the other, they can basically reshare the, the shares of the key. I see. Okay. And so the, the VM needs to be notified whenever there's a change to the validator set and goes through this key resharing protocol. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. What, what protocol do you use? I, I know you said you, you're using one off the shelf. I'm just curious which one. Uh, for the key generation? Yep. Um, good question, actually. Let me, uh, we have a white paper on this, so I'm happy to send across all those details. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I'd love to look into it. The, um, the one other question I was going to ask is, uh, can you talk more about how you actually handle the uh, how you actually handle the decryption operation that happens within the EVM? For let's say, like you perform one, uh, like there's one opcode that needs to handle this decryption operation, but in order to do that decryption operation, you actually need to do this threshold across the the validator set. So does that mean that in order to process that individual opcode or pregama or whatever however this is happening on the back end, uh, that every validator that you need to go through this protocol um, in order to decrypt the value at that point? And everybody has to have reached that point in the execution of the EVM to know that, that they are authorized to perform that operation. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So okay. basically, we're asking all the validators to execute the smart contract code. Uh, in this case, even, even for view functions, um, because we, we want the, the ground source for uh, or truth for, um, uh, for whether or not decryption is allowed. So basically, this access control to be determined by the smart contract. So that each validator will then execute the smart contract. Uh, and if they reach a re-encrypt, they will say, okay, but now uh, I have independently reached the point where I'm okay to enter this threshold protocol. And then they trigger the threshold pro protocol between all the validators. I see. Okay. So how do you handle the case then of uh, like answering ETH, like an ETH call, API call? Does that have to go through uh, the validator set as well? Um, so everything that's kind of native to the blockchain, we can just execute as, as normal. It's only when you're running the smart contracts. I see. Cool. To, to touch on that like a little bit more though, at, with the ERC twenty example of like get balance, like that's typically like a free call that you can look up a value on chain. But if it's requiring the participation of the full validator set, do you have to charge for that? Like, is that does that remove the ability to basically freely check your balance? Yeah, yeah, it would. So um, we are looking into how to incentivize validators to be part of this. Obviously, you can do things around caching, but but that wouldn't necessarily be efficient. So the uh, one benefit of the underlying encryption scheme is that it's deterministic in the implementation as well. So caching is, is an option, unless, of course, uh, the balance is, is changing. Um, but yeah, right now, in the current setup, in order to execute view functions, you can't just do that on an arbitrary uh, full node, basically. You need to touch the validators, and then uh, they agree on this. Cool. One other question. Um, so if, you're, if you have to perform this, uh, this threshold operation across the validator set of the network uh, in order to process a block and potentially get multiple different opcodes. Do you do any kind of optimization of like, we've accepted this block and then sort of defer the verification of the state route so that you can then after the block, after the ordering of transactions has already been accepted, you then actually go through and say, all right, this is the set of operations that we need to do. Or like, how do you actually go about sort of efficiently figuring out this is the set of operations the validator set needs to collaborate to decrypt versus uh, just in the middle of the execution of the EVM, okay, pause, decrypt, continue execution, where you have to wait on everybody to hit that point. So we haven't actually looked into uh, into much of this. We're kind of just executing along the way. One thing I don't think I mentioned in the slide, we do have what we call an optimistic require statement. So instead of right now, and every time you hit a require, there's a threshold protocol for the encryption of the Boolean uh, being triggered. Um, but it's a nice pattern as well to say, okay, but we... Uh, we can kind of, instead of, we can just record that, okay, this requirement needs to be checked before we can do a decryption or before we do a re-encryption. Re so you can kind of accumulate the requires uh, in an optimistic way and then just check them before you do a decryption and, and, uh, and a require, or re-encrypt, sorry. But that, of course, has a, there's a, there's a trade-off here because you are still paying for all the computations up until that require. So we have both. If you want to do like an immediate require, 
and then immediately trigger the, the threshold protocols, then you can do that, but you can also do it optimistically and uh, uh, and you wouldn't even see. So we've also seen applications where you don't, where people feel like too much leakage is happening uh, by the transaction itself being reverted. And that's where things like the CMUX comes in, that basically you would never revert the transaction. You would effectively turn into a no-op uh, if the conditions were not satisfied. Um, the downside, of course, is the additional uh, cost on gas when you do that. So yeah, it's really interesting. Oh, go ahead, Stephen. I was going to say, like, so for, like, the require, really, in general, any, like, logical branches, I understand that you're going to have to, like, have some form of um like decryption encryption mechanism but like could you instead use some of more like constant time operations so like in a lot of like encryption stuff in order to like hide private keys you have these like constant time things where they like basically do all the same operations every single time regardless of any branches um or like logical branches uh to basically avoid timing attacks but in this case could you do a similar mechanism to basically avoid these encryption decryptions? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so this will be a way to, for instance, to get around the if if branching, uh, where you need to run. So I think in in the in the MPC or the secure computation literature is is typically called like a straight line program, uh, where you yeah you you're executing all this stuff independently. We thought about having um, a compiler kind of step. Um, I, I'm not sure how we would inject it into the Solidity compiler because, again, we, we wanted to keep everything on the developer side, like untouched. You just import the library. But you could imagine at least uh, having kind of a, a compiler step that would transform uh, an if-else uh, statement into this kind of straight line constant time uh, program. Um, the problem there is, besides having to touch on the developer side, uh, is also that uh, the Solidity code is typically not um, side effect free right so you might touch storage in one of the branches and not in the other one and then all of a sudden you have to touch storage uh, in both branches uh, when you do things with the with the cmux so you can reformulate all of this stuff with the cmux but we figured it, it wouldn't necessarily be intuitive for the developer that okay i always have to pay for storage and uh, there could be a potential race condition you'd have to i don't know how you would even solve that necessarily uh, where um, if the if the true branch is uh, up, uh, executed before the false branch, then whatever state you say, so yeah, it uh, it becomes complicated. Um, it could be done. I think theoretically it could be done, but in practice and giving a good developer experience, I think it's a bit tricky. Um, we had a hackathon after ECC, and this was one of the issues that we kind of came across that people are not naturally. Uh, used to thinking about uh, CMOX, for instance, and, and using that instead. I wonder if um, you could use some like trick where you keep track of all of like the evaluated like conditions. So like in like uh, assembly uh, for like some architectures, they'll have like specific opcodes where they be like compare and add or something. And like if this evaluates to true, then add. Otherwise, no op. Right. And then if you had like an if else, you can just have basically both of those where you have the if true add in the first branch, otherwise no op. And then the other case, if false add, no op, you know, kind of thing. And you yeah. basically just inline both. Yeah. Um, it'd be pretty, pretty interesting. I don't know how that would, yeah, I'm sure it's be a huge pain to implement, but yeah, I think basically like, I, basically I think in order for this to like work in like a network that like is actually like larger, like, I feel like you're going to have to, like, avoid as much of the threshold stuff as possible in the actual execution of the block, which is why I'm, I'm kind of, like, diving so so deep into this specifically. Yeah. 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 No, and, and so one of the things that I would take away from, from some feedback is also that, yeah, people, they, they uh, first of all, CMUX is a confusing term for this. It makes sense in the technical literature, but it's not something that, that people are used to thinking about. So maybe we rename it to to if if then else uh, as a function call, and then it still takes like three inputs, but it's called something else. Um, but yeah, also teaching around like what is the what are the good practices for dealing with some of these issues. The CBOX still requires that there's like a threshold encrypt re-encrypt internally, though, right? To like change what the cipher text is. Uh, no, so that's a purely local operation. That's just a homomorphic operation. Okay. 
So you can, uh, I think there's various ways of implementing it. Um, I think the one we implemented is, uh, let's see. Uh, so you take the, um, you take uh, the true value and you subtract the false value and you multiply that with, uh, how does it work? Yeah, then you multiply. Yeah, so you take the true value, you subtract the false value, you multiply that with the condition, and then you add the false value. It does. So it, it basically, yeah. Since it's integers, this will work. Interesting. And that still ends up producing a an unknown ciphertext at the end that's independent from the first two. Yeah, yeah, because you're you're essentially evaluating this small linear function over the over the ciphertext. That's cool. Um, I'll, I'll just start asking some of my questions too, unless anyone else has. Oh, uh, so um, is the threshold uh, decryption verifiable? Like. Like what I mean by that is like obviously the the validators are going to be partaking in this protocol and they're going to be like generating some some new some like the decrypted value. But as a user, like you're not going to be able to actually look at this chain and understand these values, right? Like so, I personally think trusting the validator set is kind of implicit in blockchains. But there's a lot of people that like the ability to locally verify all the like state modifications and like is that something that you kind of have to give up for this? Yeah, oh, excellent question. Um, it's tricky because, yeah, um, ideally we would like to tie all this stuff down to proof of stake. So there is there is kind of two separations, right? Like like execution um, and and consensus. We're not touching any of that um, because the homomorphic operations are just done locally. Um, so all of that stuff is still tied to to proof of stake. But where we are relying on a threshold assumption right now is is for the decryptions uh, and, and the re uh, so the um, yeah, the the, the re-encryptions um, and tying that to proof of stake um, so far is very expensive, or at least expensive uh, in terms of, of having to generate proofs and so on. Um, so we're currently what we do is we're just providing the components for someone to build a blockchain. So we're trying to keep this a bit flexible about okay, what what would the partner actually want to do in this particular case? We also have two suites of protocols: one for if you're running like five validators, so think more in a permission setting, and then another set which. Uh, we're currently benchmarking around 40 validators, I think, um, and then give some flexibility there. Um, but yeah, no, it, it is a good question. Like, how could we get efficient, publicly verifiable MPC protocols uh, for this stuff? Um, and I think we're, the research is still going on uh, on that. Um, as an interesting uh, kind of uh, example of this, so when we do the re-encrypts, right now for performance reasons, what we do so okay so so when you do the re-encrypt you basically run an npc protocol to take the fully morphic encrypted ciphertext and then turn it into secret shares among the validators and then instead of kind of turning that secret share of the value into uh, an encryption under the user supplied classical public key we just encrypt each share with the user's key and then send them back to the user and then he can decrypt and do the reconstruction the secret sharing scheme we used for all of it is a robust secret sharing scheme, meaning that we can detect um, and we can not only can can people or validators disappear, uh, we can also detect cheating. But in this particular case, the where we currently are is that the the user, since he will see these shares, he can do the robust reconstruction, and he will know which validator lied, but he wouldn't be able to do anything about it with the current setup because um he can't otherwise he would have to run an, an expensive zero knowledge proof um but he basically has a choice between saying okay i know that some of the validators lied so i don't trust this result or i'm going to reveal enough shares so that someone else can really see that one of the validators lied but revealing enough shares for someone to check this also reveals his own value so he has this kind of choice between okay either i ignore the value because i know it or i i tell the world but then i also tell them uh, what my private value was um, so there is an efficiency trade-off there. In principle, um, we think it can be done, um, but for efficiency reasons, um, yeah, uh, it's still interesting to kind of consider a middle ground. That's super interesting, yeah. Thank you. Um, if no one else, I'll keep going. <laughs> uh, so I know we had talked about how, like, 
when verifying the block, you have to kind of like perform lockstep, like decryption, encryption um, on the network to be able to like actually continue processing through. Um, have you considered, uh, well, okay, I guess first question, uh, how does that work with block building? Like is the block builder the person that actually has to do this in the first place? Or is like, is the whole network building the block as they do this? Or like, how does that work? So we we kind of so underneath at least for the DevNet here um, we're just using so this one is based on Tendermint so we get the block has basically been been uh, been committed to and then it's a question of just executing that block afterwards so the block builder doesn't have a special role outside of, of a normal uh, consensus in this case they determine the block and then afterwards they figure out which transactions uh, were were going through and which were reverted do you still have like gas refunds though like if it's like a early revert happens or like say like you want to do a DeFi swap and in the swap in the case where you actually perform the swap it's like really expensive but in the case that you like just check your like slippage and then immediately return like do you actually re like return that gas that wasn't used and like if so like how can you prevent someone from like just kind of like submitting like large transactions that don't actually do anything on chain. So, so we're not actually touching any of that. All right. So, we work normally. We're, we're not encrypting, let's say, the native uh, coin or currency for the blockchain. So, if you want to, you can you can compute the gas cost, and then if you want to revert some of that or pay back some of the gas cost, you can you can do that. None of that is encrypted, so none of that touches the threshold network. But, but I guess like, how can you actually calculate what the total gas used of a transaction was without executing it is i guess my question oh like gas estimation how that's so is there a gas a gas estimation i think is typically like off chain like guessing the gas limit but like on chain like if i'm the block builder and i have like you know 20 million or like 15 million gas for the block limit and i have a transaction whose gas limit is 15 million it might use up to the whole block and without executing it, I don't actually know how much gas it uses. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. So yeah, so this number you, you won't have. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, the block builder has less information. Um, related to this, we also looked into whether or not it could be a, a solution for MEV because you can, you kind of hide this information. Um, but there is a question of efficiency there that this is probably down the, uh, down the line. Uh, my, I think my last question. Uh, <laughs> I know we're already ru we're running low on time, but this is my last question. Um, so, is all of the uh, like integer operations, like the multiplies and adds, is that all like finite field stuff, or like do you have to have any special handling for like overflows or like things like that? Like this might be specific to like the homomorphic, like explicitly like operations, but. Are you thinking from a solidity perspective or the underlying encryption scheme? Underlying encryption scheme. Uh, um, so it's modular arithmetic underneath, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so, but there is the question related to, to solidity, right? That you, sometimes you would want to have overflow checking uh, in your smart contract. Uh, this would be expensive to do because this would be a decryption to see if something actually overflowed. Or you can, I guess you can kind of correct for it if you, you can detect homomorphically if an overflow happened. But you wouldn't know because that will be a, a, an encrypted value. Um, so either you do something with CMUX where you have, okay, if I know if it happened, I want this value. Otherwise, I just accept it. Um, but yeah, the underlying encryption scheme is is based on modular arithmetic. So after all the the hardball questions from Stephen, I was gonna throw one softball in there. Um, what are you mo what use case are you most excited about for this? And what's uh, what's the most interesting and exciting feedback that you've received from developers uh, that were playing around with the last week at ETCC? Oh, good question. Um, so what did we have? Um, we had someone implemented the dark pool uh, for swapping. Uh, someone did uh, voting. Um, I think the the one that we're currently seeing some interest in, not necessarily from the hackathon. I think someone did at the hackathon as well. But for the overall, uh, we think there is a, a a good chance for tokenization as a use case for this, where you want to keep um, 
you want to keep some of this data private. So you want to see what's going on. You want to see the computation that's happening. Uh, you just want to keep the, the data that's being computed on uh, confidential. OK, then I have two more slightly hard questions. Have you thought about, like, as a, and, and I'm, not, I'm not a cryptographer, so let me know if this is a horrible question, but have you thought about having data that's on chain that's encrypted to both the, uh, the global homomorphic public key as well as potentially owned by someone off chain? So for example, like I might, my balance on chain might be such that the global homomorphic key can decrypt it as well as my own key that I have off chain could decrypt it as well. Would that be something that would be interesting to you? Because then you can like request just the ciphertext, which every validator should have, and I could even run my own validator, which is not participating in the decryption, and then I could decrypt my own relevant values. Because that sounds to me like if that were possible, that would be really, really interesting and escape a lot of these issues. So you're thinking to avoid the re-encryption step, basically? Yeah, to avoid some of the uh, yeah to avoid the, avoid the re-encryption step where you have to send it to me off chain. Would it be possible to say, okay, we have this ciphertext? And that it can actually be decrypted by both the global homomorphic uh, key as well as some key that I own as the user. So you're constantly encrypting it to uh, to two parties, both the the validator sets shared key as well as some some person off chain. Um, we we kind of started out. So we've gone through a few iterations, and initially we thought about having a separate key per user. Although maybe that's not exactly what you're saying, but but at least we thought about having a key per user. And at some point we also thought about having a key per smart contract. The problem is that it really gets in the way of composition. Um, so for instance, in the in the blind auction uh, uh, example I, I gave earlier, you, you would have data coming in from different users encrypted under different uh, uh, public keys. And then when you want to actually compute the, the winner of the auction, you end up with this ciphertext, which is now encrypted under a, a bunch of user keys. You can do this. So um, there are ways you can run um, a decryption protocol that then takes like inputs from all the users but the problem is that then you would have all the users to kind of come back and provide part of uh, given allowance that okay now you can you can do this. So if a user drops out, then you're a bit out of luck on this. So having uh, distinct user keys really gets in the way of composition. So that's why we and then the same for contracts, right? That you might say okay, one contract uh, has its own public key and all the data for the contract, but then having the blind auction called the ESC twenty token uh, that starts to be complicated for the same reasons as well. Um, so that's why in the end we said, okay, let's have a single public key, uh, and then all the data is just, and then you're you're free to compute on it uh, any way you want. Cool. And then my other slightly harder question was, um, have you thought about reducing some of the functionality to avoid some of these issues? Because it sounds like what you have is really really cool, and there are a couple of things that make things more difficult. So I'm curious if you guys have thought about like just, all right, these are hard problems, punt them down the road. This smaller set of functionality is really cool by itself. Have you thought about doing anything like that? Uh, I mean, I think so, at least from the homomorphic perspective, homomorphic encryption, perspective, that um, we are kind of already doing that. So um, maybe just touching back on Slama as a company, right? So a large part of the company is working on the core homomorphic library, both from a research engineering perspective. And the, the particular encryption scheme is actually really powerful. Uh, so powerful that on top of it, we're building uh, two applications. So one is the blockchain we've been talking about, and then the other one is machine learning or, or data science. Um, and I think one of the benefits of trying to put this into to blockchain is that you already have a relatively limited number of functions and operations that you want to do. Um, but the underlying encryption scheme um, can actually do, so you can have arbitrary functions in it. Uh, so if you want, you can basically evaluate the lookup table when you on the homomorphically encrypted uh, data. Um, so we are, to answer your question, I think we're already boiling it down to things that we say, okay, we expose this in Solidity and in the FHEVM um, because this is the most useful or we can we can optimize performance for it. Um, for instance, the CMUX, uh, we have, we're working on research to, to get a very efficient version of, of CMUX because that's a kind of a well-defined operation we know we need in the, in the Solidity. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, maybe I'll just promote a tiny bit there. I, I think the, um, so we, we're kind of we're happy with with our or the, the, this particular encryption scheme, um, especially for blockchain, because it has some nice properties. The one is you can evaluate these arbitrary functions, uh, including comparisons, which you can't do exact in other encryption schemes, uh, fully homomorphic encryption schemes. Um, but you also get exact computations. So some of them they you give approximate results, whereas in TFHE you get exact uh, results. 
Um, and then finally, yeah, you can you can have these uh, you can have the arbitrary computations that are also deterministic. So this is what allows every validator to uh, do their own computation and then do a comparison at the at the byte level afterwards for consensus. Awesome. Thank you so much, Morin. I think that's uh, that's all the time we have. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining. I really appreciate you taking the time today. Thank you very much for inviting. This was a pleasure. And great with all the questions. Loved it. Right. Awesome. Thanks so much. Bye, everyone. See you, everybody.